So this discussion is going to look at the eyes, ear, nose, throat, and mouth, look at various pathologies that could happen either due to trauma or infection. Um, we're also obviously going to be going through some of the, the relevant anatomy and physiology related with all these different areas. So if we look at the anatomy and physiology of the eye, we're going to go through all the different structures that are um, of importance and kind of and kind of highlight them. So if we look at the sclera, the sclera is basically the um, outer protective area of the eye or the white of the eye when you're looking at it. The cornea, which you can actually see on here as well. So the cornea is just a clear outer covering of the eye that you have. The conjunctiva is a thin mucous membrane that goes around the eye and eyelid. So the conjunctiva is actually kind of continuous. So you have the conjunctiva that actually covers the anterior portion of the globe, um, and you have the conjunctiva that lines the eyelid. The iris is the pigmented portion of the eye, and that's going to be responsible for, for controlling the pupil, which with the pupil is going to be responsible for uh, letting light into the eye. So um, the, the pupil, your, your textbook, um, and this is kind of a, a good way to think about the pupil, um, the pupils compared to the aperture lens of a camera, so just basically allows a certain amount of light to enter the eye. So the pupil is going to get bigger or smaller depending upon um, how much light is into room to let that um, enter the eye. Then you have your anterior chamber. Okay, so the anterior chamber is formed by the space between the cornea and the iris and is filled with what's called the aqueous humor. So you can see that on the picture here. Um, that then takes us to the lens along with the ciliary body. So the lens allows for uh, the images that we see to focus and the ciliary body is actually going to help control the lens, okay? So the ciliary body is basically like a little ring of muscular tissue and with contraction and relaxation um, controls the degree of focus depending upon whether we're trying to focus visually on a near or far object. Um, the ciliary body also is responsible for producing the aqueous humor that, that fills that anterior portion of the eye. Then as we get to the, the more of the posterior part of the eye, you have the, the retina, which is kind of a multi-layer tissue that lines the inner eye. Um, that entire area, and you can see it on the picture there, is filled with what's called the vitreous humor. So the vitreous humor is more of like a gelatinous substance that sort of fills the, the posterior portion of the eye. So again, the retina is that multi-layer tissue that kind of lines the inner surface of the eye. Within the retina, you have a couple important structures. So you have the macula, which shows kind of like is responsible for like detailed central vision. And again, that's kind of within the, uh, the retina. And then you also have what's called the faveva, which is located within the retina as well. And that also is responsible for um, central vision, but it's responsible for even the, the sharper details when you're looking at, at central vision. Another thing that I want to point out um, on here, there's not a bullet point for it, but I also want to point out the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is what sends impulses from the eye to the brain. And when you look at the inside of the eye on an ophthalmoscope, you can see a part of the optic nerve known as the optic disc. Um, so that's the, the part that you can visualize when you're actually looking at the um, eye through an ophthalmoscope. This picture shows the, the muscular structures, which we're going to get into um, on the next slide. So the optic nerve, I talked about it previously. Again, that's going to be the, the structure responsible for sending the, the nerve impulses um, back to the brain. I talked about the macula and faveva on, the, on the, the previous slide as well. Again, they're responsible for just central vision, and then the, the faveva is responsible for the sharp details in the central vision. Uh, when we're looking at the orbits, so the orbits are the bony area that the, the, the eye kind of is, is rests in, and it's made up, of, the orbit is actually made up of seven different bones. So the orbits are, are kind of, a, of seven different bones coming together. You have the frontal bone, the zygomatic bone, uh, the maxillary bone, uh, the ethmoidal bone, bone, the sphenoid bone, the lacrimal bone, and the palatine bone 
all come together to, to form the, uh, the orbits. Then you have the muscles of the eye. Um, so you have the recti muscles, the superior and inferior rectus, and then the medial and lateral. And a pretty good picture off to the side here, kind of demonstrating what those, where those muscles are. And then you have the, the oblique muscles. You have the, the superior oblique muscles and the inferior oblique muscles. So when you're looking at the movements of the eye, all your movements are controlled by those six extra ocular muscles. Um, so the four recti muscles are responsible for adducting, abducting, elevating, and depressing uh, the eye globe, whereas the two oblique muscles contribute to circular motions, okay? So you know that our eyes don't just move in like straight planes, we can kind of move them in multiple motions. And, and in the case where that's happening, you're gonna have multiple muscles. So just for an example, when we're just looking at um, kind of like our basic like uh, motions, like for instance, elevation. So for, the, for individuals to look up, the superior rectus is gonna contract to cause the, the globe to kind of look up. If you're looking down, it's gonna be the inferior rectus. If your, your eye is adducting, it'll be your medial rectus. If it's abducting, it'll be the lateral rectus, okay? Now, when we're talking, again, kind of like diagonal circular motions, that's where the superior oblique and the inferior oblique um, are going to be getting used, okay? So think about if you were to look up and to the right, up and to the left, you know, what muscles would be working kind of in, in order to do that. So kind of just, you know, take a few minutes and, and just kind of think about that based upon, you know, what we had mentioned with the, with the recti muscles. And again, one of the basic things you're going to be doing anytime you have trauma to the eye is checking to make sure that you have, you know, normal bilateral eye motion um, to make sure that none of the muscles are, you know, muscles or any of the surrounding structures are, are getting um, compromised. You also have the lacrimal apparatus and the lacrimal apparatus is going to be what, what basically produces and distributes tears. Um, so again, tears are used to kind of wash, uh, you know, foreign particles out of the eye, um, and that's what's going to be responsible for your, your tear production. So if we look at the anatomy and physiology of the ear, and I'm just going to pull all this up because it'll be easier to see in the picture. So the ear is basically constructed into three sections, and you can see, looking at the picture, what structures are basically involved in each section. So you have you have the external ear, which is basically the part of the ear that you know you can visually see, um, when it contains the external auditory canal, and that's going to be responsible for just kind of helping move sound waves basically to the tympanic membrane, or what we call the eardrum. So the tympanic membrane forms the outermost portion of the middle ear. So at the middle ear, you have the tympanic membrane, and then you have the three small bones of the ear, which are the, the malleus, incus, and stapes. And what's going to happen is when, you get, when sound enters the ear, it's going to vibrate the tympanic membrane, and then that's going to send... Um, the sound to then the, the inner portion of the ear. Okay, so the inner ear is responsible. Um, the structures in there are the semicircular canals and the cochlea. Um, so the, the inner ear contains those two and basically the, the cochlea and the, the semicircular canals are responsible for or each have specific functions. Basically, the, the cochlea is, you know, functions to continue the conversion of sound waves to nerve impulses for the brain to interpret. And then the, the semicircular canals are responsible for helping you maintain balance. Okay, so, you know, the inner ear is, respons is, is partially responsible for our ability to maintain balance. Um, and that's, so that's what we're looking at as far as the function there. Uh, you also have the eustachian tube, which you can see the eustachian tube right here in this picture and the eustachian tube actually connects the middle ear to the, the nasal passages so this actually connects to the an opening to the nasopharynx and what that actually does is it kind of allows for the regulation of pressure within the middle ear so it's not uncommon for people who you know have colds and sinus problems to develop some some issues with the eustachian tube which could cause some ear pains so that's why like 
you know, particularly even a lot of upper respiratory infections, you hear people complaining of ear pain, um, and that's partially responsible for that. Here's just the, the outer portion of the ear and some of the, the structures involved with the, um, within the outer portion of the ear. So just some anatomy. Looking at that, you have the helix, the antihelix, the tragus, the antitragus, and the earlobe. So if you look at the anatomy and physiology of the nose, so the, when we look at the different bones kind of surrounding the area, the nasal bone actually, so the nose itself, um, really only the top portion is bone. The upper one third of the nose is bone and the rest of it is actually formed by cartilage. Uh, so when you're actually looking at the structure of the nose itself, really you only have the top portion that is made up of bone. The rest of it is made up by you know, cartilage and other soft tissue. You have your, your four different sinuses. You have your frontal, ethmoid, and, uh, and maxillary sinuses that um, form the, the, the area in and around the nose. And then as we kind of move through, um, so you have your nasal cartilage, and then in your nasal cavity, you have, you have what are called turbinates. They're three curved bony structures, and they're highly vascularized, uh, basically covered with a highly vascularized mucous membrane. And you know, again, the nose is basically responsible for when you take air into your nose, um, the nasal cavity is an area where your air gets filtered, warmed, and humidified before passing on to the rest of the upper respiratory and into the lower respiratory tract. So before you get into the, the nasopharynx, the nose is kind of the first area where you kind of warm and sort of filter that, that air before it hits your lower airway. Okay, so looking at the anatomy and physiology of the throat, uh, you have the tonsils and adenoids. Both of those are, are lymphatic tissues that assist in fighting infections. The tonsils are right in the back of the mouth and then the adenoids uh, line the back of the nasal cavity. The uvula is just a, a soft tissue structure that is in the back of the throat between the two tonsils. You have your epiglottis. Um, the epiglottis is basically like a little flap that lines um, it basically sits between the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. So we'll talk about um, the different parts of the, the pharynx or the throat. But basically, the, the epiglottis is responsible for preventing food from entering the larynx, um, which we'll be talking about what the larynx is in a little bit. But that's what the epiglottis is for. So as you're eating and swallowing, the epiglottis will close so that the food can be directed into the esophagus. So the pharynx or the throat is uh, basically the, you know, it's an area of the body that one allows food and fluids to pass from the mouth to the esophagus, and then also for the air to pass into the lungs. It's divided into three sections. You have the nasal or, nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. Um, there's a good picture in your textbook. I have a, a picture of the mouth and, and um, the, the upper part of the throat, but you don't really get to see these individually. You could see them a little better. Basically, the different parts of the throat that align with their respective other anatomical structures is where the different regions are, what the different regions are named for. The esophagus is going to be responsible for, um, again, getting food and fluid as it goes from the mouth. It's going to go through the esophagus and then into the, the upper part of the digestive tract. Your larynx, um, your larynx has three different functions. One, it prevents food from entering the trachea. Um, and then it's also responsible for uh, sound production or what we'd call your voice box, if you will. And then it's also responsible for the, the coughing mechanism. Uh, here is just kind of a, a picture of the upper portion of the mouth. So you can see some of the uh, structures we talked about. As I said, there's a good picture in your book that kind of really shows you kind of the to differentiate between the different parts of the uh, of the of the pharynx, and then you can also see some of those other structures and kind of how they're involved with the um, with the throat and the mouth. Okay, so further looking at the mouth, looking at the teeth. So adults have 32 teeth. Um, the visible portion you can kind of see on the picture here kind of kind of illustrates all the different important anatomical structures. So the top portion of the tooth that you see is covered with uh, enamel. It's what we call the crown of the tooth. 
Um, inside that and, and kind of extending down deep is what's known as a substance called dentin, which is actually a little harder than, than bone. As we kind of go down, the, the area beneath the gum line is known as the root. And you could kind of see um, within the root how the, um, how the nerves and blood vessels kind of go into the kind of innervate the tooth. So the root of the tooth basically, again, sits below the gum line. It's in the bony socket. The blood vessels and nerves provide circulation and uh, sensation to the tooth. You have the periodontal ligament, which is responsible for holding the tooth in the socket. You know, one of the efforts when somebody gets a tooth knocked out to be able to reimplant the tooth, uh, maintaining the viability of the uh, of the the periodontal ligament is very important. And many of the efforts in in trying to uh, maintain that allow for successful reimplantation of the tooth. And then you have what's called the pulp cavity. And again, that's where, again, a lot of the, the, the nerves and the blood vessels, um, you can see that anatomically where they kind of go into the, uh, into the tooth. So if we look at signs and symptoms of the eye, and again, there, there's various signs and symptoms that'll come about as a result of the various pathologies. Um, Again, some are more significant than others. So pain, discharge, double vision, uh, itching, photophobia, which is sensitivity to light, um, ptosis, which is, a, which is a drooping eyelid. Um, and again, that comes with some pathologies. You have, you have uh, tearing, increased tearing. Usually that's gonna be occurred to some sort of irritation. Uh, you get halos around lights. Um, again, that can be reported in various um, eye pathologies, light flashes and floaters, um, anisocoria, which is unequal pupils, which is actually a normal finding in about 20% of the population. So, um, you know, just, you know, that's something that you might want to note on like a pre-participation exam. So when you do do uh, an evaluation, whether it be a neuro evaluation for, um, you know, a closed head injury, which, you know, you'd be doing or doing an eye exam that you note that. Uh, nystagmus, which is another thing that could occur with a head injury. It's a neurological pathology, and it's just a, a rhythmic oscillation of the eyes, or some people call it dancing eyes. Uh, protruding eyes, um, where you can get either retraction of the eyelids, and the, the eyes are kind of just protruding out a little bit more, um, or a curtain over the vision. And that's a significant finding. So again, that would be something that would possibly indicate a, it's usually associated with a detached retina um, or detached uh, uh, vitreous humor, and that warrants um, medical emergency. So again, as you're going through the different uh, pathologies of the eye, you'll see where, where some of these kind of fit um, as far as the signs and symptoms are concerned. So for the ear and nose, um, tinnitus or ringing in the ears, uh, pain, loss of hearing. With the nose, again, very common with your allergies, upper respiratory infection, any runny nose, congestion and, and pressure within the, uh, the nose, the nasal region. With the throat, you have pain, difficulty swallowing, um, white or red spots. Uh, many of the you know, throat infections can produce white or red spons spots on the tonsils and soft palate. So again, that could be indicative of an infection. And looking at the mouth, so various things to note, pain, swollen, bleeding gums, any type of sensitivity, bad breath, or what's also called halitosis, and any white or yellow plaques, um, which can be indicative of uh, fungal infections of the mouth, so an oral candidiasis uh, would present with, with white or yellow plaques inside the mouth. So for your exam, again, it's going to be specific to the region that we're looking at. So for the ear, um, again, if they're complaining of pain, you could put a little bit of traction on the ear to see, you know, possibly that they have an ear infection. It could kind of tell you you know, where their, you know, where their ear infection might be, you know, a, a middle ear infection versus something like a, um, a swimmer's ear. The, uh, you could also palpate any of the orbits and the, the bony areas around the nose. For the eye, you're going to want to do a little test of visual acuity. Um, you're also going to want to look at the, the shape of the pupils and also look at their um, reaction to light. So you'll inspect the pupils for size, shape, reaction to light. 
Again, be aware of um, anisocoria, which is a normal finding in some people. So again, that's helpful if that kind of comes up in the um, in the in the uh, pre-participation exam because it could just help for for future reference when you're when you're dealing with having to evaluate the eyes or if you're evaluating them for a head injury. When, when you're doing a reaction to light, you should really do essentially two different tests. So you should test for both a direct and what's called a consensual response. So obviously for the direct response to light, you just look at the, the eye. So for instance, if you're looking at the right eye, you shine the pen light into the right eye and you should see the normal constriction. Um, and then you'd test the opposite eye. So again, any failure to respond to light, that would be immediate referral that then you also want to test what's called a consensual response. So again, you would again, if we go back to the right eye, you'd shine the pen light into the right eye. However, you look at the reaction of the opposite eye. So when the pen light is shined into one pupil, the other pupil should also still constrict. And again, if that doesn't happen, that should be considered abnormal. So you'd look for both a direct and a consensual response. And I said there were two, technically there's three. Um, you'd also do what's called the what they call swinging test, where they would they take the light and rapidly go from one eye to the next. And each pupil should constrict immediately when the light hits it. If by chance one pupil were to dilate as you're kind of quickly going back and forth with the light, um, again, that would be another thing indicating that there's a, a problem with the, uh, with, the, with the optic nerve going between the, the eye and the brain. Um, again, you check your eye movement. So you check your eye movement in all planes check for peripheral vision. In the picture I'm showing you here is a cobalt blue light test with a fluorescent strip. So here you're lightly touching the, um, the, the eye with the fluorescent dye. And what that's gonna do is when you shine a cobalt blue light on it, that will then kind of show that there would be a, a corneal abrasion. So that would test for corneal abrasion. There's also the ophthalmoscope, um, which you'll get familiar with you'll be using that to kind of visualize the, um, the structures of the, the inner part of the eye. So for, for visual acuity, um, obviously in the clinic, you can test an ability, a person's ability to um, read an object at 20 feet with a Snellen chart. Um, and that kind of gives you a little better idea to test distant vision. And then people sometimes use what's called a Rosenbaum pocket card to test near vision. So again, when you're talking your Snellen chart, it's hung on the wall at eye level, and then you have a 20 foot marker away from the wall and each eye gets tested separately. So you'll cover the opposite eye. Um, if, the, if the patient would wear glasses, he or she would, would, should be tested with the, with the glasses on. Again, the patient would start with the smallest line and move upward until they can um, correctly read more than half the letters. If the patient is unable to read the, the top line at 20 feet, um, they could be placed a little closer to the chart, and then the test could be repeated. Um, another thing you can do if you don't have, I mean, chances are on the field, um, you're not going to obviously have a Snellen chart, and you may not even has, have the Rosenbaum pocket card. Uh, what I've done and used for people is when I just want to test their visual acuity, um, I forget who recommended this to me, but they just take a, if you take an alcohol prep pad, most people have alcohol prep pads in their kit, and kind of have them read it. it. It has all different size letters, so you could kind of get a little different idea. You just kind of hold it about, you know, 14, 16 inches away from their face, much like you would do with the Rosenbaum pocket card, see if they could read it. Then if you want to test, um, test their ability to look at a distance, um, to test their distant vision, you could just have them even like read a score, you know, if you're at a sporting event, have them read the scoreboard or a sign that's far away. Um, that usually gives you a pretty good idea. Over on the other side, you have a picture of the ophthalmoscope. So um, take a look at the procedure for using that in your textbook. But the picture on the bottom shows you what the retina should look like through an ophthalmoscope. So you can see the optic disc and the blood vessels and the macula and basically what the, um, the inside of the eye should look like um, with the ophthalmoscope. Then for the ear, you're gonna use the otoscope for that. And the otoscope can be used for the nose as well. And here you have a, a picture of what you should see in the inner ear with the, uh, with the otoscope. And they're showing you two different techniques um, for, 
for utilizing. So basically two different ways you could hold it with your hands. Again, ideally you would, you know, you could kind of put a little bit of traction on the ear. The little bit of traction on the ear will kind of straighten the external auditory canal a little bit, make it a little easier to see. But with that, you should get a good view of the tympanic membrane. Um, and then you could also, you could even see in the picture, it's a real clear, um, clear picture of the tympanic membrane and you can see the little bones of the ear as well. Um, you'll see in the slides when we talk about the pathologies, what, what some abnormal findings would look like um, when you're using in, when you're, when you're utilizing an otoscope.